online seminar in a couple of weeks uh, using Zoom. So we're very excited about that. We're moving into the 21st century. Um, and the announcement is going to be in our next newsletter and then uh, separate, so like in the next week. So look for that. Um, so if you're interested in doing anything related to budget, please sign up for that too. Thank you. All right, moving on to our second speaker. Frank Edelblue was sworn in as commissioner of the Department of Education in February 2017. He started his career, as you probably all know, as a businessman going from a certified public accountant to chief financial officer of a public company before he became an entrepreneur. Before becoming commissioner, he was a Republican member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Frank has been married for 32 years and has seven children, God bless him, who are all home educated. His nomination as commissioner was strongly challenged because he doesn't have a background in education. But Frank is a very smart and thoughtful person, which anyone who talks to him realizes. That along with his business background makes him an outstanding person to run the Department of Education. Relevant to today's talk, he has a vision to make education accessible to everyone. I give you Frank Edelblue. Uh, so good morning, and good morning. thank you for letting me join you. Um, so you, you might be a little bit disappointed. So Ian had this like cool, you know, PowerPoint presentation with all that artwork. So I've got my little <laughs> notes on the back of a recycled piece of paper that I like cut up and uh, and use. Um, but hopefully it will be uh, equally as challenging and engaging and thought provoking for you. Um, so Ian, just a quick note, you know, you mentioned Babelfish, so the technology exists. I actually have it in my office trying to um, find someone to pilot um, real-time translation. You do need one of these devices, uh, but someone talks to you in a foreign language and you hear it in a different language in your ear and then you can speak and they can do the other thing it's right back then. And it costs $167, right? Like, <laughs> like, wait, how about that? More of those things. <laughs> Um, everybody can hear me okay? I don't have to hold this up. All right. Um, so it was interesting that the topic, when Jody sent this to me, the future of, I think it was the future of education initially, or was it the future of schooling? Because those are different things. Okay. So I'm not sure which one you want to talk about, but I was thinking it was the future of education. And um, it was interesting. I just felt like when I read that, that there was an implicit, depending on how you read that, you might reach an implicit conclusion that there is a definitive future of education, right? That it's aiming at a specific point, and if we only, and there's been a lot of this thinking in education, if we only did this, right? This is what that future looks like, and everybody who does that, then somehow that's magically gonna solve all of the problems. Um, and I think that that would be bad thinking, and I will challenge that probably as I kind of talk through some different points this morning. Uh, like you, you wanna purge from your mind that there's a, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of a, a, uh, the golden ring in education. If one does this, then that somehow is gonna solve all the problems. Um, so I really wanna think about it in terms of, you know, the future of education is that there will be a future, okay? So you can't stop that. We are marching towards that future, whether we want to or not, um, it will happen. Um, but as you're thinking about what that future will look like, a lot of times in education over, and again, um, it's been going on for a long time, but I tend to pick on the last 40 years where there's just been um, cycle after cycle of education reform. Um, so when you think about the education and we think about what it should look like and how we put it together, I like to think about uh, systems, and I'm going to talk a little bit about systems, but what we're after in that future is a be verb, not a do verb, right? In other words, like it is something about what we're trying to become, and if it's a be verb, it happens. Those things that we aspire to, those things that we want the system to do for us, just happen because of who we are as an education system, and it's not yet another program or something that we superimpose on a system to do by, by force, whether that's force of government or force of school boards, or force of educators, or force of whatever it might be. Uh, because when you reach a, a, a B equilibrium, um, you know, it becomes much more organic and has the ability to kind of move forward. Um, if, and I'm gonna share some things with you, and Ian has shared some information with you, and I was imagining as I'm coming talking to school board members, um, there are a lot of reasons why we need to um, 
make some changes in education. And so I can talk about a lot of different things. If you want, you can ask me those questions, but I'm gonna put one on your radar. I shared it with the Legislative Committee uh, this week, um, speaking to the Education Joint Legislative Committee for Senate and House to this week. Um, but this is a reason that you can take back and when you're, when you're communicating with your superintendents, when you're communicating with your uh, you know, curriculum and instruction folks, when you're communicating with whoever it might be, if nothing else, this might help you. There is what's referred to as the equity gap, and I'm sure that people here know what equity gap, what the equity gap is, which is really kind of the disparity in performance between maybe either the norm or the average and certain subgroup populations. Um, and we know, uh, Ian pointed out that um, you know, in, when we give students kind of statewide assessments, uh, we get somewhere around 45, 50% of those kids to the goal, which is what we say, here's what you need to be successful in life. We get about half of the kids to that goal and then we graduate 90% of them. But when you begin to deconstruct that, we get about half of those kids to that goal, what you'll find is um, that certain subgroups don't perform well. And in particular, uh, students um, who come from economically disadvantaged homes, right? they tend to perform about 20 points, 20 percentage points less than that norm. Um, and so if someone were to say to you, like, well, why do we meet, need to make education reform? I would advocate that uh, we are leaving a whole bunch of students behind in this current system. So we march on, but there's a bunch of kids it's not working for. Um, and it's not that it's just not working for them because that phenomena that it's not been working has been going on for 40 years. Um, probably since we started measuring it, which basically means it probably was going on before that. Um, but the disparity is growing, right? So what you'll find is, you know, as Ian pointed out, our results are flat. So we may be spending more money and our results are flat. But if you come from an economically disadvantaged home, your performance is getting worse. So the disparity is growing. So this system that we've created that theoretically is supposed to be the great equalizer is becoming the great divider. Uh, of the students who actually are able to get um, you know, the knowledge and the skills to be good citizens and um, those who are not getting that. So if you need a reason, uh, you know, you can, when you're talking to your superintendents, when you're in a school board meeting, ask about that. You know, what is the disparity? How, what are we doing? Why is this existing in our school system and what are we gonna do about it? Um, and what's interesting is for in New Hampshire, we, are, we I, uh, and sometimes I know if, people don't recognize this, but I mean, we've been a leader in education around the country for a long time. I know sometimes people have a hard time, like, they're like, really? No, but I'm serious, we have actually, there was just a survey that came out this week, I think it had us in the top five, you know, compared to other states. Um, but remember that those are relative measures, right? So if you're doing really well, but we're getting half of our kids to the goal and everybody else is getting like, you know, 15%, then I'm still not feeling good about that, right? Um, so I want to move something, I want to move things forward. But again, as you're talking to and dealing with your superintendents, um, these may come in handy as you communicate kind of a, a urgency of like, why can't we move some of these things forward? So in 2005, uh, the State Board of Education adopted rules. That's a long time ago, by the way. Um, so in 2005, the State Board of Education adopted rules in the 306.04, I think it's 6K. Uh, that basically talks about uh, the importance of creating, of harnessing all of the community resources to help students get success, right? And part of the reason that the State Board back in 2005 did that is that they recognized that the system that we built is inaccessible to many of these students that come from these socioeconomically challenged environments. The system that we built can be hard to access by um, students with IEPs. The system that we built, for whatever reason, you know, our minority populations perform lower. And so the question is, have we built kind of, um, you know, kind of implicit barriers to some of those students? Um, in 2011, uh, there was a uh, report commissioned by the State Board of Education about extended learning opportunities. And that basically is getting kids outside the building to basically learn. Uh, what we find in particular for many of the socioeconomically challenged students in particular, but I think it works for everybody, and I think Ian kind of pointed to this, is that when kids are engaged in their education, they do better. 
And not only that, they don't get into trouble. Um, and in 2011, the State Board of Education said, basically in this report, all kids ought to have this experience, right? But in spite of the fact that we said all kids ought to have this experience, I was in a high school just before Christmas in one of our larger high schools, and two of the students had that experience this year, right? So we're not, we, we recognize it, we know we need to do it, but we have had a hard time moving. It's hard to move a system, quite frankly. Um, and then I'm going to show you a video now. Where's Ian? Um, you know, and I, I share this video. It's interesting because Ian's like, well, did you see in this video they didn't say such and such? The point of this video, this is a video that was made in 2012. Um, as Jody pointed out, I don't come from a background in education. Uh, I do come from a background of trying to be thoughtful and read a lot and understand things and try and figure out how to make things work better. Um, and so in 2012, the company that produced this video for, um, I think it's, it was in conjunction with the state of New Hampshire, um, they are the education establishment, so to speak, right? These are the education experts. They're saying we need to move. Uh, we need to do something differently. And so I just want to show you, it's a, not that long of a video, but we'll go ahead and we'll show this video and uh, then I'm going to come back and chat some more at you. The future. As a country, we have always embraced the future and discussed many big ideas about what the future may hold. All of us have a common interest in the future. Kids. What does the future hold for them? Our current system is failing our kids and our country. We know that America is falling behind. We are not getting kids where they need to be in reading, science, and math. Education is a critical part of the solution to every problem we face. The key question is, what does the future of learning look like and how will we create it? When we think about the future, we're usually doing one of two things, dreaming or dreading. When we dream, we start with an idea, a positive trend, and take this idea to its logical conclusion. We imagine a utopia that represents our hopes for all that's possible. Maybe that idea is a belief in the promise of technology to transform learning. What would that look like? We might dream of being able to assess each student's needs, and then magically give them exactly what they need, exactly when they need it. But this is impossibly perfect and simplistic, ignoring the complexities of the learning process. When we dread, we start with a fear, a downward trend, and we likewise play out this idea to its logical conclusion. We imagine a dystopia, one filled with our fears of what might happen in the future. Here, the very same issue, the use of technology in the classroom, might veer off in a completely wrong direction with dreadful outcomes kids trapped in a matrix of robotic instruction. Of course, this is equally simplistic and ignores technology's potential. Whether dreaming or dreading, our role in the future we imagine is usually passive, where the future is something that happens to us and to those around us. But there's a third way we can think about the future. Between dreaming and dreading lies designing. For designers, the future isn't a far off place. It's a place where they work every day. Design is a form of activism. We imagine the future we want, then pick up the tools to start building it. Designers see the world as a kit of parts. They reshape and reassemble the best pieces from what's already out there to create something new and better. So what does it take to rethink learning? It's not about replication. It's about selecting and integrating many different parts to create the foundation of a new model. This is the art of integrative design. From birth to adulthood, society's purpose is critical, to accelerate our learning. And what's most important for kids today is learning how to learn. Society must develop learners ready to tackle challenges they cannot anticipate. <coughs> Education is a system we created to serve that purpose. Over 100 years ago, we invented modern schooling to send kids to one of three main places, the factory, the farm, or the university. 
We always lost some kids, but this model provided a middle class life for most and economic growth. Over time, the economy changed. Farm jobs diminished and office jobs surged. College grads always had better access, but there was also a path straight from high school to the office. As office work changed, it got harder to get there from high school. Eventually, that path disappeared. College became the main path to opportunity. We started sending more kids to college, but we didn't change the overall system. Education broke down, trapping too many kids on paths that no longer made sense for them or for the country. As farm and factory jobs continued to decline, we started to lose even more students. The retail sector rose up to catch them, but these low-skill, low-wage jobs often failed to move kids forward in life. With the decline of good jobs, kids had nowhere to go. Retail increasingly offered the only alternative. We lost even more students to dead-end futures. More high school graduates tried to get into college, but found they were not prepared for success, academically or financially. Fortunately, community colleges emerged to help people re-engage in their own learning and seek new pathways forward. They helped many students get back on track, but most students still found their way to community college on their own, or by accident. Today, far too many kids exit the K-12 system feeling stuck. Our model of school is broken. To understand how it's broken, we need to look inside. We see a system of six parts which create a student's experience. First, what they learn, how they learn, and how we know they're learning. And also, where and when learning happens and who's involved. How we configure these parts determines how kids move through the learning process. More often than not, these parts form rigid barriers blocking the way forward or putting kids on the wrong path. Various innovators have focused on adjusting one or two of these parts to help kids move forward. This has spurred important progress, but this approach is not the answer. What we need is learning integrated by design, addressing all parts at once rather than one or two in isolation. When we get this right, we make it possible for kids to accelerate their learning, to move forward in the direction they want to go. The best design models require kid power. Students must apply themselves to the learning process. It's our job to give them this chance, and we believe that's more possible now than ever before. Our research shows that a few key attributes are central to the new models we need. Future of learning models must be personalized, learner-driven, applied, cost-effective, and tech-enabled. And of course, kids don't power this system on their own. For every model, a set of outside conditions can either block its progress or help it take off and really work for kids. Without the right conditions, <coughs> better models cannot take hold and scale. But just imagine what the future of learning would look like if we aligned these new models with the conditions that help them succeed. It would be a future where schools help kids get what they need to become successful learners and to accelerate their learning. But while school remains critical, it's not the only place where learning happens. Kids must be able to explore all their opportunities for learning, both in school and beyond. When we create a single integrated system, students will practice becoming lifelong learners, ready to go on to college or good jobs, ready for the challenges and opportunities of the future that awaits them. This is society's new purpose. We're already mapping this new learning ecosystem. We call our map the human capital continuum, the paths that learners travel from birth to age 26 as they prepare for success in the adult world, and where far too many get stuck at key transition points. At Two Revolutions, we design and launch future learning models and help... So it's only a commercial after this. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I just thought that that video would be helpful. Um, keep in mind, so this is produced by people working in New Hampshire in the education system, right? So sometimes I say, like, if I'm critical of the system, the pushback I get is, oh, you don't appreciate our schools. So these are the experts saying many of the things that Ian has said, many of the things that we are trying to say, and recognizing the... Um, kind of the mandate that we've got to do something different that has kind of been set up. Um, so I think when we think about this video, and I'm going to 
uh, relate back to that a little bit, but even if you think about the current system, like we're trying to move a system, and that is a very difficult thing to do. But systems are built on premises. In other words, and premises are the things you believe about the system, and I wanna challenge kind of the premises that our current system is built on, and I think you as school boards will recognize some of these. Um, so the premise that the current system is built on uh, is that we can educate students as a cohort, right? That there's a certain amount of homogeneity to a certain group of kids, as Ian pointed out, the, the main factor is what day were you born on, right? Like, oh, okay, well, if you were born on this date, plus or minus 180 days, you must be just like all the other kids that were born on this date, plus or minus 180 days. Uh, so that is kind of the core premise. And the premises that you hold about a system, they determine how you see the problems that the system encounters, and the questions that you ask about the system and the solutions that you're going to come up with for that system and so again this is really evident uh, when we think about the cohort model and there are certain questions that i hear over and over again relative to the system that just i say to people i'm like you're only asking that question because of what you believe about the system because of your premise about how the system is supposed to function so for example how many of us have heard Every kid in third grade should be reading, right? All third graders should read, right? And I just say like, well, what a dumb question, right? Because we got kids who should be reading kindergarten, we got kids who are in second grade, they should be reading. But if they're not reading, nobody cares because there's not third grade yet, right? Because you're supposed to read in third grade. <laughs> then we got other kids who, they're not, you know, just because of maturity and who they are as individuals, maybe they shouldn't be reading till fourth grade or fifth grade. You know, I got a kid, one of my own kids is working at Google right now. He didn't learn to read till he was, in 12, he was 12 years old, right? Because uh, he had some struggles with it, got it. But he's doing fine. But if that kid is in fourth or fifth grade and he's not reading and the cohort is supposed to be reading in third grade and the whole system is built upon and dependent upon the kid in third grade being able to read and you got a kid who can't, whoa, you just messed up the whole cohort. What are we gonna do? You know, how does the system handle this? Another example that I know every one of you deals with all the time, and again, I would say that the only reason you would ask this question is that you have a premise about cohorts is, what is the ideal class size, right? Should I put 20 kids together? Should I put 25 kids together? Should I put 18 kids together? And it is, again, you'd only ask that question if you believed in that you could manage students as a cohort. Because we know that if you have a cohort of 20 kids, there are kids in there, and Ian alluded to this, who are so high functioning, all they need is a computer and an internet link, right? And boom, they're off and running. And there are other kids, particularly in some subjects, that you can put them in a cohort of five, you can put them in a cohort of two, and they might struggle. We also know I've got educators who can take a cohort of 75 kids and deliver a lecture that's so engaging, everybody's on in the game. And then you got other educators who don't have the capacity to engage five kids. So again, this, the premise is this cohort model. Um, if you think about it, what we've done is we build this kind of linear learning model, right? That, that says you just you start here and it's this straight line, but all of the learning science will tell you that that's not how individuals, how children or people learn. It's a very jagged process, right? There are steps and plateaus and growth spurts. I tell people, if you want to know how people uh, learn, you go to go home, and if you have ch children, you know what I'm talking about. You open up the closet, and you have these little lines on the inside of the closet, which is where you mark their growth, right? And there's a little date next to it, you know. Phoebe was this tall on this date and this tall on this date. And sometimes those lines are close together and sometimes they're far apart because that's how like learning works the way that those kids grow physiologically. Um, and so what we have to, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share one other um, example of this cohort model that, uh, that I see that is an example of where I, I think um, we harm kids. Uh, and again, so you've got this cohort and the cohort's moving along and if a student can't fit the cohort for whatever reason, we pull them out of that cohort. And so I have an opportunity to visit all the different programs that we have in the state. And oftentimes I go to visit what are referred to as our behavioral programs, right? So these are kids who they have, for some reason there's a behavioral issue and they can't fit the cohort. Um, and we pull them out and the, it, it's a little bit discouraging sometimes when I go to these because the programs are great, the kids are awesome but we spend more time with those kids, not trying to get them the skills and the knowledge that Ian talked about,
but to give them the capacity to fit back into the cohort, right? We just try to find, how do I unwrap them back into the cohort so then the cohort can continue to march on and nobody's disrupting the cohort, as opposed to just recognizing maybe they're a little bit different. I mean, the example I like to use, and I like to have self-regulated kids, so don't get me wrong here, but you know, you got little Billy who's in fourth grade and Billy cannot sit in his seat and be talked to and somehow function, right? His brain is disconnecting, his little feet gotta move, he's gotta do something. But we say, no, learning happens sitting down, right? And um, I just, I joke about this because if you go to the Department of Education, I don't know if anybody's been in modern offices these days, everybody wants a stand-up desk, right? Because you gotta work standing up because it helps me to think better. I'm like, why is it that half of the people at the Department of Education can work standing up, but little Johnny has to learn sitting down, right? And I'm like, can't he learn standing up too? Like, yeah. just, <laughs> okay. Uh, so we just, so there's premises. So I think one of the things we have to begin to challenge is the premise upon which we've built this system and move away from the idea that I can manage students as a cohort into a new premise. And actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one more um, example, because I think I have a little time, right? I'm doing okay? Another example of how this premise um, you know, manifests itself and how, uh, and I don't, know the, I don't know the conclusion of this, but I'm gonna throw it out there. Anybody ever read uh, Malcolm Baldridge, Baldridge's book, Outliers? Yeah, so we got a couple of those. Okay, so then anybody, well then. Gladwell. Mel Gladwell, that's who it is. I always say Baldur's. I don't know why, because, you know, that uh, so yes. the lean manufacturing. Okay. So, um, professional hockey players are disproportionately born in January, February, and March. Anybody know about this? Okay. Um, the reason, and so these are the professional <coughs> hockey players. And so there was, Gladwell did some studying, trying to figure out why is it that professional hockey players are born in January, February, March? Is it the cold weather, some people say? Like, no, it has nothing to do with that. Um, and so what he did is he just kept peeling back the onion and he went back and he looked at the Pee Wee Leagues. And so the Pee Wee Leagues have a cutoff date of January 1st. And so when those kids go to the tryouts, the students who are born in January could be as much as close to a year older than the kids who are born in December. And, those, and as a result, those kids are bigger, stronger, more mature, more coordinated. They get recruited onto the A team the other kids get recruited onto the B team. Now, if you're on the A team, you get more ice time and you get the best coaches compared to the kids on the B team. And so immediately we create this disparity that takes place such that 20 years later, you have more professional hockey players who are born in January, February, and March than you do born in December and November and October. So this is kind of an implicit bias in the system. Well, I mean, I can, there was a recent study that came out of, uh, I think it was a Harvard study, that looked at students who um, have uh, 504s, ADHD types of diagnoses, right? And guess who gets has more ADHD in these diagnoses? The, the younger kids, right? Because obviously they're less mature, they're less self, less, less self-regulated. They don't fit the cohort very well, do they? So there's got to be a problem. So what do we? We don't. We're not trying to say like, how do we help this kid as much as how do we get this kid to fit into our model, our cohort model. Um, and so we, I can tell you that, you know, we're doing some work on this at the department because there's somebody else who happens to give once a year type of an assessment over here, you guys as well. And I can tell you that students who are younger perform, you know, five to 15% lower on uh, my achievement assessments, right? I don't know what the answer to that is. We're still trying to dig into it, but are we, do we have some kind of implicit bias that we take these kids just because of their birthday and they're younger that we somehow treat them differently? Do they have a higher incident of IEP? Are they the not smart kids? Are they the kids we have to separate? And when we separate them, then we differentiate their learning and they don't get the best coaches. And as a result, we create these disparities. So we really need to be willing to kind of relook at this premise of can we manage kids as a cohort? I believe that the, uh, the premise that we should hold for our education system is that kids are inherently curious and they want to learn. Kids are inherently curious and they want to learn. And kind of the anecdotes, and I reckon, you know, it's important when you have a premise, I recognize this is my premise now, right? And when you have a premise, you gotta recognize it's your premise because you gotta know that that's gonna drive what you see in the system, the questions you're gonna answer and the solutions you're gonna come up with, right? So just as there's a flaw with the cohort premise, there could be flaws associated with this. The importance is recognizing those, uh, you know, those premises that you hold. But my anecdotes that I hold forth that kids are inherently curious and they want to learn are, 
uh, you know, if you don't believe me, leave a three-year-old alone in the kitchen by themselves for an hour, right? Probably not gonna be waiting for somebody to say, can I have a worksheet? Right, no, they're not. They're gonna open cabinets, they're gonna bang pans, they're gonna explore, they're gonna do things because that's who we are, that's our humanity, right? Try dropping uh, a group of teenagers off on a street corner in Manchester, and you know, like 16-year-old uh, kids on Manchester, and then come back four hours later and see if they are waiting for an assignment. Like, oh, well, nobody told us what to do. No, kids are gonna be kids. Kids are gonna learn things. Like, it's inherent in who we are. And so our, our challenge really is, you know, three-year-olds alone in the kitchen can get themselves hurt, right? So can we build a system that doesn't stifle that curiosity, but allows it to draw them and bring them to positive outcomes, to good places? Can we channel that curiosity that takes 16 year olds who want to learn and allows them to achieve great things because of that curiosity? And I think, uh, you know, Ian kind of even described some of this. He was talking about how, um, you know, the, uh, that, um, like to engage the kids somehow. I'm trying to remember how you worded it in, but it's something about that. Like you got, you know, kids, kids are curious and they want to learn and we have to let that be the driving force uh, that goes beyond there. If you've got a kid who's just saying like, I don't want to learn anything. Let me just say, first of all, I don't, that in my world, again, because I have my premises, I don't think that's true, right? You're saying like, they don't want to learn anything. All they do is want to play on their computer games. Well, clearly they want to do something, right? Because they're not that doing nothing. So you got to figure out what is it that gets them excited and kids who are engaged and want to, you know, and, and like something are going to be more engaged in learning and they're going to go forward with it. Um, so, um, what I also want to talk about here is, and I kind of hinted at this in the beginning, is that there is not one solution, right? Like, so there's not one solution for a kid, right? Because they're all different. There's not one solution for a community because communities are different. Uh, there's not one solution for the state. So you can't, we can't say like, what is that golden ring? If we just do this in our school, then everything's going to be okay. Um, so what we really want to have is, I call them community conversations to talk about some of the things that I've been working on. Um, so I platform for education. Anybody seen I platform for education? Okay, so not as many people as should, given the fact that you guys are all school board members, just to be clear. Um, so I platform for education, it, it is on the, um, the department website. Uh, and essentially what this is, is a, uh, an approach to harnessing the vast, vast, vast amounts of data that we are sitting on up at the department and make it ubiquitously and transparently and easily accessible to everyone. Um, and so uh, that's there, you know, all the data's not there yet, but we're working towards that. But I mean, I had enough that I could launch this thing, so it's out there and you can take a look at it. Um, and, but it, here's a quiz, but you can't, if you were at the table where I was talking about this before, um, you're not allowed to answer this question. So it's actually referred to as iPlatform 9.75. And I only, because you have to have some fun in life. Anybody want to venture a guess as to why it's version 9.75? Not quite a 10. Not quite 10. <laughs> there is that, yes. It's more creative than that. Platform 9.75. Thank you, Platform 9.75. For my Harry Potter fans that are out there, right? Platform 9 and 3 quarters, okay. Because this will bring you to a mystical world, okay? Um, and so you can just enjoy that. Um, yeah. But I shouldn't have to explain it. I'm, I, thought, I assumed that more people would like grab that one, right? Not everybody that. has kids. <laughs> What's that? Not everybody has kids. And, you, know, Harry, you know, adults can read Harry Potter too. It's, they're good books, very good literature. Common Core has moved us off of fiction and more instructional text, so it's uh... Well, who assumes that's fictional, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so what I really want this to do is it should start conversations because there's all this information that exists out there that you can grab hold of and you can use and, and have conversations at your school board meetings. And I'll give you an example of how this has played out. And, and quite frankly, this has been embraced by, you know, I haven't found anybody who's not happy about iPlatform. Um, and I, I set up kind of a little bit of a, a, I don't know if a challenge would be the right word, but we have two of our superintendents are both Cascadians in the state and they are related uh, via marriage. Um, not to each other, but to uh, brothers and sisters. So, uh, and one is in Berlin and one is in Bow. Interesting, they both have those B districts, right? And what's, this is the kind of conversation that I think is important to take place. If I look at Bow 
and I look at Berlin and I run just my um, performance, the achievement test results, what you'll find is that Bo, high socioeconomic, you know, outperforms Berlin by a considerable percentage, right? But as Corrine Cascade and the superintendent in Berlin pointed out, if I look at student growth, Berlin outgrows uh, Ber uh, Bo. So Berlin students are growing faster than the students in Bo. So who's doing a better job, right? In other words, depending on who it is that walks into your school and your community, you know, if you're growing the kids faster than the kids over here, I don't know, like, what do you value? Do you value kids growing? Um, so again, that's the kind of conversation, and it was very enlightening, as Corrine described it to me, for her school board to say, like, look, you know, uh, we are, we're working on a lot of things, and, and you can see that, but there's lots of data out there as an example of how you might uh, use that information to start and have conversations about what's going on in your individual districts. I have a question. Just clarification, what is, what is the growth measurement? What's the growth valuation? Mm -hmm. what? Yeah, so it's the mean growth percentage. So we basically just take the students, the standardized assessments that they have to take each year, and we just do year over year off of those, so, yeah. Uh, but great question. This is the, this, you always got to peel back. Like, well, what is it based on? Is it good information? Is it not good information? Um, okay, so there's that. And then the next program that I want to talk about, and I think Ian um, kind of mentioned this, but in, it was interesting in your presentation, you had that nice picture of a library, and you refer to, if, what, imagine, right, just like let's imagine if we had a space. Well, I'm blowing out the spaces with my Learn Everywhere program because I don't want kids to have to go to a space. There could be spaces, could be no space. I don't know what there's going to be. So has anybody read anything about the Learn Everywhere program as an example? Okay. So I would also encourage you to go out. There's a Q&A document on that. And I talk about um, Learn Everywhere uh, because Learn Everywhere achieves many of the things that Ian was talking about. Learn Everywhere achieves many of the things that are illustrated in this video um, about trying to um, free up education. It turns out that learning is not limited from 7.30 to 2.30 inside some walls. In fact, sometimes I think the system might believe that maybe like 85% of learning happens when you're from 7.30 to 2.30 inside these walls and maybe 15% of it happens outside of that. I actually think, and I don't have any empirical evidence on this, is probably at least flipped, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that these kids are engaging in things that they like and they're interested in and they're not in those, those pictures of those bored kids in the in, uh, slide deck. I mean, those kids are not learning when they're getting, when they're bored out to death right there, right? And then they can't wait to get out of school and they're learning things. There, there's a an interesting TED talk, if anybody wants to take a look at it, uh, from some experiments that have been done over the last 20 years where you just take a computer and you put it into a rural, uh, you know, um, third world country community, right? And you just leave it there and you let the kids have access, unfettered access to it. They don't break it. In fact, it takes them, I think, I forget if it's like two hours or three hours, they figure it out and next thing you know, they're doing stuff with it, right? And one of the things that they discovered is if they put that computer there and they put an adult there to help, nobody learns anything, right? All of a sudden, they're just like, wait a minute, right? So, um, you know, the way that Learn Everywhere works is it's really an attempt to try and harness learning around the community. Um, and examples, and this is happening, the learning's happening already. I'm just trying to make it work, right? So I'll tell you a couple of stories of how this program kind of got on the radar, but, or um, not, not even a but, but. Uh, I was in a high school, I was in Central High School in Manchester, and it was about 8.30 at night. I don't know what I was doing there so late, except that this robotics team was there, and I think I was probably visiting them. Um, and uh, I walk in, and there are kids, and they're programming in Java, getting their robot to navigate through a course. Some other kids are working with two engineers from Bosch, uh, designing the robot. They had a hacksaw out, which I said was a really bad sign at 8.30 at night to get the hacksaw out, because Clearly, I don't know how this robot's going to perform. Um, and then the young lady, a young lady was the, the captain of the team, and she came up to me. She says, Commissioner, you have to help us. The school's going to close at 9, and we need to be here till 10, you know? And I'm like, ding, I win, right? I've got now kids begging me to open a school. But then, you know, as I'm reflecting on it, these kids are going to go home, and then they do their homework, right? Because all of this that they've been engaging in and learning up to this point in time, that doesn't count because that's not school, that's just fun, right? Well, why does learning have to be torturous, right? We don't have to make it that way. 
And as you begin to look around the community, what you'll find is that kids are engaging in all kinds of programs and learning all over the place. Um, you know, and I, I, it's easy for me to reflect on my own kids because I remember what they're doing because I have to pick them up and drop them off. But, uh, you know, boys and girls clubs have these theater art programs that are just wonderful, right? And the kids are so engaged and they're practicing and they're learning stuff. So why is it that they got to go to practice in tech week every night a week? They're there till like 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. Then they do their homework and then they go back into school to get the learning done when, and they might even be in an arts program like in the school, right? So if they're getting the arts, like why doesn't that count as an arts credit? Um, New Hampshire Institute of Art is running an after school program in a tough neighborhood in Manchester uh, for kids to come. It's taught by college professors. And I get it that New Hampshire Institute of Art is trying to build interest in art so that they can get more students future, in the future into their college. Um, I'm not intimidated by that motivation because I'm intimidated by the motivation that they've got kids and they're teaching kids art who might not otherwise get art. I've got financial programs in almost all of the Boys and Girls Club, financial literacy programs, consumer math programs, uh, consumer finance programs. Why, is that, why does that not count? Um, I have programs in my schools Right? I've got kids who are going to math class and they're not doing well. And so what they do is they've got an after school math program. Probably many of you guys have these in your schools. And we put a tutor with them and we teach them math. And then we say, now you gotta go back and get credit for the math. Like, well, if, this kid, if the after school program is working, why do they have to go back? Just let them finish the learning and they can move on to the next thing. Um, so Learn Everywhere is kind of a little bit along the lines of what Ian is saying, kind of like, can we bust out of uh, what's going on? Um, as well as trying to create a context for lifelong learners, right? Uh, imagine today a kid's driving down the road or is pedaling their, bi they're pedaling their bicycle down the road and they go by the school and they're like, that's where I learn, right? And then they keep going on and they get to the YMCA or they get to the ball field or they get to someplace else and they say, this is where I have fun, right? Why have we segregated learning off, right? Learning, ha we know that. Learning happens all the time, all over the place. So uh, can we create um, that environment um, that everybody can learn? So let me just see one thing. There was an, I was taking notes on some of the things Ian was saying, and I have one here. Oh, okay, yeah. So one of the things Ian said is, he's saying like, can we allow the future to come into the schools, right? And I think that's a beautiful, I love the way that you said that. And I would say what Learn Everywhere is doing is we're allowing the kids to go out to the future, right? So in other words, like we don't have to bring the future into the school. How about if we just let the kids go out to the future because the future is happening all around the school. It's not isolated to that school. I want, this, I want the future to permeate the school building as well, but I think that we can move the kids to the, toward the future instead of uh, moving the future to the kids necessarily. So, um, you know, it's not gonna happen uh, in one place, it needs to happen all around us. So um, I, I am gonna make an ask though. So Learn Everywhere is uh, before the State Board of Education on February 14th. It's going to, uh, like we have the rule proposal out there. We've got lots and lots of support for this, um, but I would love to have some school board members either write letters or um, uh, if you wanna come in and testify, say I'm a school board member, and I think this is gonna be good for my kids and I can explain the program in more detail to you if you're interested in that or you can go look, there's a Q&A on the uh, website uh, that will explain a lot of it as well. Um, but, you know, um, I just, I thank you for letting me join you this morning. There are some thoughts about the future of education, being too far ahead of ourselves, but really just thinking about some of the next steps that we can make. Thank you so much. Rock TV.